I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Genesis, back to chapter 37. I'm not going to look at uh, all these chapters that deal with this particular individual, but I thought it would be good if we paused uh, once again and uh, thought about the life of Joseph. <coughs> so if you'll turn to Genesis 37, let's just take a, a moment and perhaps read the first 13 verses or so together. Genesis 37, verse 1, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, a foreigner, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, note this, being 17 years old, just a teenager, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. That doesn't mean that he had like a rainbow uh, colored coat. Uh, actually, what that refers to is that he had a special outer coat or tunic, it would be called. Uh, probably it was long-sleeved and perhaps specifically ornamented that it would be distinctive. And, of course, because of his favored position in the eyes of his father. His father was partial, which is not good for dads nor moms. And verse 4 and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brothers, and they hated him the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. The old, <clears throat> we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. His brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream. And he told it his brethren and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more. Behold, the sun and moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying, and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. Down to uh, verse 19. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. We'll say some evil beast hath devoured him. We'll see what will become of his dreams. We'll pause there a moment and pray. Thank you, Lord, for the account of Joseph and his life. <clears throat> we thank you for what you want to bring to our heart tonight. And I pray that you would enable both the messenger and the listener we need the Spirit's anointing. So we pray to that end. We thank you that we can depend upon you. Lord, right now, I take the Spirit's enablement, and I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you undertake for me and for all of us who look to you, who depend upon you. Get glory to yourself, Lord Jesus, through our thoughts tonight and prepare us as we testify of your wonderful works, and as we come before 
that throne, that throne of grace and uh, that mercy seat. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the reasons why we pray on noondays on Wednesdays is it's good for a church to pray corporately together. On Wednesday nights, like tonight, we'll break up into groups of two, no more than three. It's good when the whole church hears one another praying together. And we do that because we're facing tough times. In this city, we're facing tough times in this nation. Maybe you're facing tough times in your own personal life. It's natural to be angry and to lash out. But you know what God wants to do? When we face tough times, he wants to soften us. He wants to teach us how to handle difficulties. Perhaps you grew up or perhaps are growing up in a messed up home like Joseph's, where you felt or you feel that you're hated by family members. Maybe you've been mistreated or you're being mistreated and you never deserved it. That's why I've turned to Genesis 37. I want us to be reminded that God knows about this kind of stuff. And despite it, he can use it. I don't think that there was a much more dysfunctional home life than the one that Joseph faced. I mean, his dad didn't have the common sense to not treat his children with partiality. And as a result of his father's lack of wisdom, his foolishness in uh, showing greater love for his son Joseph, and I'm sure Benjamin too, the brothers grew up hating Joseph. And they wanted to kill him, as we've just read. I don't know if you face that in your home. That's pretty, that's pretty brutal. Uh, that really, I think, tops it all. Not only is he hated by his family members, but they literally wanted to kill him. I want us to pause a moment. I'm going to share three P's with you. Hopefully that'll help you remember them. Three P's that I think are just what we need in tough times. And the first one is this. You ready for it? Plan. And by that, I mean, God has a plan. God has a plan whether you do or not. In fact, you might have a plan, but God's plan is much more important than any plan that you and I can come, up, can, can come up with. And when you think about God's plan, you should also recognize that God's plan involves a timetable. And God's timing is extremely important. I don't know how you're wired, but my personality is I am a very impatient person. And God is always dealing with me about that. God is always trying to slow me down and, uh, and teach me to wait upon him. And I have learned some, not totally, I haven't arrived, but I have learned that God's timetable is extremely important, that it's not good when I jump the gun. It doesn't work out well when I am impatient and I put my plan and my timing ahead of God's. Obviously, I don't want to be behind God's timing either, but I don't want to jump ahead either. And one of the things that we need to consider about God's time, about God's plan, is first of all, the duration of it. Have you discovered this? God's taught me this so many times over and over. He's not in a rush. God takes his time. It's almost invariable that 
when I want something to happen right away, it doesn't happen until the 11th hour. It doesn't happen until there's no hope. Until, okay, it, it's not going to happen. And then God comes through his way, his time. God's never in a rush. God's timing is totally different from yours. And let me tell you this. When we talk about the duration of God's time regarding his plan, I think we should, we should really take this into account. The actual length of time that it takes for God to work his plan in our lives is the necessary amount of time to accomplish the purpose that he wants to accomplish in his plan in our life. Which would lead me to say this, when you and I resist the plan of God, when you and I resist the purpose and the will of God, our resistance and our rebellion against God's plan will always lengthen the duration of the tough times that we're facing. The tough difficulties of the time will be repeated until God's purpose in our life is reached. So we have a say, in some sense, in the duration of God's plan in our life. Don't resist it. Don't rebel against it. Because you'll find yourself often repeating the same tough times over and over again until God accomplishes his purpose. But his plan not only involves the duration, but it involves, even more importantly, the attention. In tough times, our focus ought to be on what is essential. And what is essential is an awareness of God. Not the largeness of the tough, difficult time we're passing through. But our attention has to be that we have our eyes on the Lord and awareness of him and not quit before uh, because God he won't give up on you, and he does not want us to give up on him. I don't know if you caught it, but in Philippians 1, 6, there's that wonderful promise that we can be confident that because he has begun a good work in us, he'll perform it until the day of Christ. God is not a quitter. God will not quit in what he is seeking to accomplish through the tough times he allows into our life. It's all part of his plan, and our focus has to be, I have hope because <laughs> I'm looking to the Lord. I am aware that God is in this and God's at work. So that's the first P, the plan. The second one is this, and it, it kind of overlaps with what I've already said, and that is in God's plan, there is always a purpose, always a purpose. There is nothing, listen to me, absolutely nothing is accidental or random in the believing life. I had a friend that would often say, he would say, there is no accidents. Everything is a God incident for the believer. I agree with that. Everything is under God's control because he is seeking to accomplish a divine purpose in the tough times that he is allowing us to experience and pass through. One day, a young pastor discovered that the janitor at St. Peter's Church in London, it's a big Church of England, big building, I've, I've been there, discovered that the janitor there, of course, of course was a paid position, was illiterate. And uh, as a result, the pastor fired him. And the jobless man uh, uh, took what little savings he had and he invested his meager savings into a tiny tobacco shop. He prospered. So he bought another one and he expanded. And he ended up owning a chain of tobacco stores in the London area worth what today would be millions of dollars. And one day the man's banker said to him, wow, <laughs> You've done so well. 
where would you be? Just think where you would be if you could read and write. He said, I'd be the janitor at St. Peter's. <laughs> he got fired, <laughs> but it actually turned out to his benefit, right? You see, God has purposes in our lives that we don't see. And I'm not saying that God's purpose is for us to be rich financially, but it is God's purpose that we would be rich spiritually, that he would enrich and deepen our spiritual lives. And when we think about the purpose of God, there's two words that I want to I want to place in your mind. The first one is ask. Concerning the purpose of God, ask. Don't get in the habit of blaming God when tough times arrive. Don't blame God. Don't ask him why, but rather ask him what. Ask God to enable you to discover what he desires to have happen in you because of these times that you're going through. There's always a purpose behind it, and God wants you to know that purpose. And God brings these times into our lives and allows us to pass through them that we might discover his purpose. So ask him, Lord, what would you have me to learn from this? What is it that you're trying to teach me through this tough time I find myself in? And the second word when we think about the purpose of God is this. Not only ask, but the word alter. I mean, not an altar, but I mean A-L-T-E-R, change, that kind of altar. You see, there is a positive divine purpose for our difficulties and for our tough times. God wants to radically alter our lives. That's the bottom line divine purpose. God wants to radically alter our lives, change our lives. We are told, and we know the verse, that all things, we know all things work together for good to them that love God. We often leave out the next verse, which really gives the what uh, what's happening here. He says, because God has predetermined that we would be conformed to the image of his dear son, to, the, to Christ's likeness, that we would be reflectors of the image. We'd be conformed. You know what that word conform means? It means to, to share the same form with another. God's purpose is that we would share the same form with Jesus, that we would look like him, not physically, that our spiritual lives would reflect Christ's likeness in them. That's God's purpose, to alter us, to radically change us, to conform us, to be Christ-like. So tough times are not just bad times that we should try at all costs to avoid, but rather they have a divine purpose, and a divine purpose that could never be accomplished in any other way apart from them. And you know what you find as you pass through these and you deepen your relationship, you deepen your fellowship with the Lord, you increase your intimacy with him as a result. You know what happens through this? You come to the realization that there is nothing else in the whole world that can truly satisfy you than Christ living in you and living through you. That's the that's the fullness of, of human life. And that's what you discover. That's the purpose. So the plan, the purpose. And the third thing is what I would call just practical. How God uses, how God uses you in proportion to how much you let him shape you how much you allow him to conform you into the image of Christ, into Christ-likeness. Your usefulness as a believer is in proportion to how much you cooperate and let God shape your life. Do you resist it? So there's three things that I think are very practical 
that uh, play out of this subject of tough times. And the first one is the word dependence. One of the practical benefits of tough times is that because God can only use you in proportion to you allowing him to shape you into the image of Christ, the first thing, the first practical benefit of that is you learn dependence. And dependence is just absolute trust in the Lord. Dependence is hoping when there doesn't seem to be any end in sight. It looks like this is tough time is going on forever. It's hope when there's no end in sight. It's confidence that no matter what you're facing, God's always trustworthy. You can always trust him because you know what? He's forever good. God is only always good. And he'll never leave you to crash and burn. I often think of Deuteronomy, is it uh, 33, verse 27, where God, uh, through Moses, says to the Israelites, the eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath our everlasting arms. That's our God. That's a promise that you and I can have the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and we can depend upon him. So the first practical outcome of tough times is dependence. The second one is what I call the word acquaintance. Dependence, acquaintance. And that is this, that in tough times, what comes out of that is that you develop a real acquaintance with God. You know, there's a, a verse, I think it's somewhere in Job, where uh, whoever is speaking says, acquaint thyself with God and be at peace. Acquaintance. You see, in tough times, God time is vital. Reading and meditating and thinking about God's word, having God program your mind to think the way that he thinks, and to spend time speaking to God in prayer, building your dependent relationship upon him. That's what prayer really is. All these tough times give God time to transfer his heart into our heart. That's what's meant to happen. So a practical outcome of them is acquaintance. We get an acquaintance with God that we hadn't had before. And then the third is what I call compliance, dependence, acquaintance, and compliance. And that is simply this. Through tough times, as you submit to the Lord, you learn to walk humbly. You walk, so to speak, on your knees, seeking God, seeking God's mind, submitting to God's way doing what God shows you. So whether the tough times last for years, sometimes they do, or months, or just a moment, don't ever forget God's time plan, so different from ours. And don't lose heart and quit because you don't see any end in sight, but rather discover that as you submit to God's purpose, everything's going to be good. Doesn't mean everything's going to clear up and you're going to have smooth sailing, but his purpose is a good one. It really is. All his purposes for us are good. They're going to do us well if we let him have his way. And you know it's good because that's only always what God is. So let God's goodness, let God's thinking, let God's way just completely fill and permeate your thinking. And ask God to align your heart with his, because our hearts are way out of line. So ask him to line them up with his. Ask him to do that. And you know what? If you mean that, he'll do it. And it, it may mean tough times, but as a result, you'll come out blessed.